Hello everybody, Crystal here at the Fibromyalgia Pain Chronicles and Veteran Voices for Fibromyalgia, teaming up today with Melissa Talwar, the founder of Support Fibro Network, and Estella Mata, Looms for Lupus, to bring you some informational videos on the best tips and tricks for legislative advocacy. But you don't have to take my word for it. I have brought in some of my friends and colleagues to share their expert opinion and experiences doing legislative advocacy to help you learn the easiest ways to be successful in your advocacy initiatives. And today's guest is Candace Lerman of Rare Candace. And uh, her background with healthcare uh, in legislative advocacy, her own personal story with her health conditions and how she was able to advocate to get medication to be used off label to put her medical condition in remission, along with she's a strong voice on behalf of the fibromyalgia community because she lives with fibromyalgia as well. And her medical experience also led to her choosing to become an attorney so that she can make a bigger impact on the rare disease and chronic illness communities, along with positively make changes through legislative and policy healthcare initiatives. So Candace, thank you for joining us today. If you don't mind uh, giving us a little bit of your background uh, your story as far as how your personal journey led to where you are today. Sure, yes. So I have a rare disease called ITP or immune thrombocytopenia. It's autoimmune. Uh, so my body destroys platelets and it puts me at risk for internal bleeding. I also have fibromyalgia and I have Shrogan syndrome. So I have quite the smorgasbord of, of chronic health conditions. Um, in 2014, I was diagnosed with ITP and I ultimately uh, researched and repurposed a chemotherapy drug called Rituxin uh, that put ITP in remission. And about eight weeks after I did that, I traveled to Washington, D.C. for Rare Disease Week, which normally occurs um, at the end of February. And I went to Washington, didn't really know what to expect, told my story. And after telling my story, things just exploded. Uh, I ended up getting involved with the 21st Century Cures Act. I started building relationships on Capitol Hill. And uh, I have been a regular, uh, a regular visitor to the Hill ever since working on a variety of healthcare initiatives and policy and pushing members of Congress and their staff to to make changes to the, the very laws and regulations that uh, sort of control our lives as patients. So, you know, one of the things uh, within a variety of medical communities is a lot of individuals, whether, a, you know, a patient, a caregiver, or an advocate, you know, they, they, a lot of the narrative and discussion that I hear is a bit of that, like anxiety and fear approaching you know, our, our lawmakers. And from your experience from, I know that we talk all the time and all of your stories going to DC and networking, but in the beginning, as you said, you didn't really know what to expect. So what are, over the years, what have you learned are like the best tips when approaching like congressional leaders uh, and also like some tips to help individuals kind of learn ways to minimize that feeling of anxiety or fear. Cause it's like the unknown, you know, like, will they care or will they listen or will I sound silly? So from your personal experience, what, what do you feel that you learned along the way that helps you network and connect with Congress leaders? Well, the first thing is to know what they call your ask is, which is what are you asking from, you know, what do you, what do you need from them? And, and what are you uh, looking to gain or what type of awareness are you looking to raise? And first thing I always tell advocates who are going to the Hill is know that you're asking for something that they can help you with. Um, if you're dealing with an, a situation that is at the state level, you need to contact your state legislature. So your state rep, your state senator at the state level, not Congress, because they can only deal with things at the federal level. Now, that doesn't mean that they can't make a phone call or two and help you out uh, at the state level, but they can't legislate the state. 
So if you have an issue, and I, I always uh, cite Medicaid about with this, right? Medicaid's a state program. If you have an issue with Medicaid, you need to go to sta- at, at the state level. If you're dealing with a, a something where, let's say you want to increase uh, funding to the NIH for uh, uh, your condition or for uh, perhaps uh, the VA, or, or you know you want to uh, address a, a disparity with a healthcare law at the national level that's disproportionately affecting your patient community, that's where you go to Congress. Um, Another thing is the expectation of who are you going to meet when you go to DC? Most of the time when you go into an office, you're actually going to meet a staffer. And a lot of people get disappointed. And I always tell them, don't be disappointed because the staffer you're meeting with is generally the person that handles all of the policy decisions and initiatives for their boss, whether it's a a congressman or congresswoman or a senator. And so those are the people that are experts. They're going to their meetings every day and dealing with the policies. They're negotiating with other offices and other uh, staffers in in healthcare or within veterans affairs or or whatever, uh, you know, a, a policy initiative you're pushing for. And those are people who are going to be your friends. Those are the ones that you want to develop a relationship with. Um, because unfortunately, members of, of the House and Senate are super busy and they handle a ton of different uh, topics. And so while they may be sympathetic to your story and understanding what you're, you're asking for, they may just be too busy at that time or running off to go up to a floor vote. So they can't listen to everything you have to say. Uh, And then in terms of how you say it, what you say, what you ask for, uh, you want an elevator pitch. I generally tell people that if you can tell your story and you're asking 60 seconds, you're good. Because there's been times where I haven't had a meeting, but I've gotten in an elevator with someone and I'm like, oh, hey, it's Congresswoman so-and-so. I need you to support my bill. And I have a 60 second elevator pitch and I am literally in an elevator in between floors giving it. And so normally I'll get a card or the staff of the Swiss will be like, oh, please email me. Let's chat or come by at 2 p.m. And like, let's talk. And you have that. The best thing you can do is practice your pitch in the mirror. Uh, You write it out, you know, and and you don't have to write it out word for word, but everybody's different. I am uh, big on just kind of bullet pointing the points I need and then I can fill it in as I go. And I just practice it. And so I, over the years, have perfected the elevator pitch depending on what I'm advocating for, if it's for myself or another disease community or, or the appropriations for the NIH or for medical research. And I just go. Um, and when you perfect that, it's, it's perfect. And the last big piece of advice I have is always leave something behind. So there's something called a one sheet. And generally, the one sheet will have information about you. It will have your contact information, so your email address, your phone number. Uh, and then your ask. Uh, and, and if you are working on behalf of an organization, have the organization's information too. I always recommend that if you're working with a, a nonprofit group, put your nonprofit's website there, put their social media there and, and connect and always ask for a card because I do a lot of emailing back and forth with people on the Hill. Uh, and it, it's just a really beneficial relationship once you get the communication going. Right. And you brought up some really good points. Um, sometimes you are connecting with someone outside of their office, like you said, in an elevator or down the hall or in the restroom. I've (laughs) done that one. So I was like, Hey, how are you? You know, and then just kind of lead into like, I'll say, I'm so excited to be here today. And this is why I'm here. And it's just been an awesome experience. And then to be in the ladies room and see you here, it's like, Oh my goodness, this is like awesome. You know? And I, I often tell people, and again, you brought up a good point, practicing what you're going to say, you practice in the mirror. I uh, write my points down on a piece of paper. And what I do is I actually video record myself and go back because I'm a person, I have a tendency to look off, you know, when I'm speaking to someone, when I'm thinking and what happens is I'll, I'll look to the distance or look somewhere else because the wheels are turning. And so I record myself on videos so I can see how I am addressing that. And, and, you know, it's kind of like, I have these also bulletin points of things, uh, to remind myself not to say I have some kind of transitioning, little uh, quirky quotes that I'll say, do you know what I mean? Or, you know, and, and recording and practicing and I'll have on my little bulletin points, don't say this, don't say that. And I record myself and I've done it where I've recorded myself over 20 times just to, you know, hammer down, not to say uh, just like general transitioning phrases into the next topic, making sure I'm making continual eye contact um, 
and whatnot, what have you. And see, that's another transitional phrase I say a lot. But uh, yeah, so I video record myself uh, and then go through and use that kind of as a barometer of measurement of how I'm doing and improving or, and sometimes I could pick up things that I don't notice that I'm doing. And I tend to be very animated with my hands. And sometimes that can be too much uh, for myself. And I'll pick up those little things that I wouldn't necessarily see in a mirror. So for myself, I like doing those recordings as kind of like that reflection and be like, oh, I got to work on that. Or, oh, that was perfect. Let me write that down. That's the other thing too, is like you record yourself or practice in the mirror and maybe you say something and it's, you know, brilliant. And I'm like, okay, I write that down. Cause I'm like, oh, that's, that's really good. So I can remember to say that again. And then, you know, you brought up another point is learning and knowing who to approach um, and starting with your state representatives and realize that, that their staffers are their right hand or right wing people. And, a, you know, a lot of state representatives have staffers that are designated for specific things. So like uh, as a veteran myself, if I have a veteran initiative or uh, issue I want to tackle, I'm going to reach out to that veteran coordinator for my state representative and start there first. And a lot of times I tell people start that connection and reaching out before you do advocacy day or go to Capitol Hill and, you know, it, it it helps to really start that connection before going, even if it's with emails or a phone call. Uh, The other thing I've learned is reaching out beforehand to the staffers. I'll ask them and and I'll just kind of play it off. Like, even though I've been doing this for years, over two decades, (laughs) I'll play it off. Like, um, especially when our state reps change over with elections and whatnot and our congressional and Senate leaders, playing that, okay, well, you know, I'm kind of new to this. And technically, if it's a new person in office, that's not necessarily a lie. I'm new to this person. So I'll ask the staffer, you know, some tips or I'll even ask them, you know, I'm nervous and what's the best approach for this person? Because I don't know them very well. Um, Sometimes those staffers can give you little caveats of information that's like personal, like, um, you know, a good example would be is if you're advocating on behalf of, uh, let's say, breast cancer and you call a person's staffer and you're reaching out and they'll say, oh, yeah, their family member had breast cancer. And you already know this going in. So um, good points are to reach out early. Don't be disappointed if you end up speaking with a staffer because they have a lot more power than we realize. And a big, big thing is knowing who to approach and you and I have discussed before like if there is an issue knowing which person to go to so if there's something you're advocating for and it might be more local then you would go to the mayor versus jumping the gun and go to your state rep or knowing when an issue is for your state governor or if an issue like you said is a federal and reaching out So those are things to research and are important to know where you could end up calling or speaking with the wrong person and they're very empathetic, but then you got to start over with the right person. So research is a big thing of here's this issue or this is what I want to advocate for. Who's the right point person and making sure we're going to the right people right off the bat. So the other thing is from your experience. um, So for myself, I've had to go to my state's capital and our national's capital uh, for both professional and personal reasons. And professionally, when I was working at social services, I was going down to our nation's capital in what I would call my zoot suit, like dress business attire uh, because I was representing my organization along with the group of people that I was advocating for. What are some uh, suggestions and tips for presentation of self and apparel? Um, I Like I said, I know my biggest thing is avoiding my catchphrases or transition or slang. What have from a personal standpoint and what have you seen in person are like the do's and don'ts of self-presentation. 
So biggest thing I tell people is you need to wear comfortable shoes when you hit Capitol Hill because you're going to do a lot of walking. And one of the mistakes that I commonly see every year from people who come are that they wear heels or uncomfortable dress shoes or something. And then by like the third office, they're aching or they have blisters and they're in the bathroom and they're like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? I have a full day left of meetings. And so uh, in Capitol Hill, you're going to walk a lot. There's, uh, if you've never been to Capitol Hill, um, there, <laughs> there's three buildings on, on just the house side uh, and you walk between them. And then there's several floors in each of those buildings. So even if you're taking the elevator, you're still doing a pretty, pretty decent amount of walking. And so you need to wear comfortable shoes, first and foremost. Uh, you'll notice if you're there, a lot of the staffers, because they have to walk a lot of places for meetings, are wearing flats or comfortable dress shoes. Uh, and the women especially. I, I always see flats. Uh, and my friends always wear comfortable, comfortable flats. Um, the next thing is your attire. It also depends on the time of year. Uh, when I'm there in the winter time, because I am from Florida and I don't do very well with cold weather because I'm not used to it. Um, I do dress pretty warmly, but one of my secrets, uh, as a woman, cause I think men, you, you just wear a suit or a dress shirt and tie and slacks. And like, that's men have it a lot easier. It's, it's business attire for men, but for women, it's a little bit more difficult. So one of my, of my tricks, because it is pretty warm in those office buildings. And when you're walking around, you're going to start sweating because you're just a lot of times when they're, unfortunately, when you schedule meetings, there may only be 15 minutes in between, and you've got to go across the whole building just to get to the next meeting. Um, I wear a lot of times like a, a suit, uh, but I'll wear a skirt. Uh, and I wear, um, like tights underneath and it's super comfortable because it keeps me warm in the summertime. I don't have to wear them. Um, I wear layers and I, uh, I'm very cognizant of carrying a bag with me and you have to be careful because you can't bring too big of a bag because it has to go through, um, a metal detector and, and a scanner similar to like when you're flying in the airport. Um, uh, but I try to also bring like a hairbrush with me. I'll bring, uh, you know, uh, makeup, deodorant, whatever else you could eat, hairspray, if you've got to touch up your hair, you know, just the typical things. She's, it is, <laughs> a lot of people think, oh, I'm going to go to Capitol Hill and just have this meeting and it's not a big deal. If you're going with an advocacy organization or for Rare Disease Week or, th or, or with another group that is coordinating meetings for you, you're going to have several meetings and you, you'll probably meet with your representative and your senator. But if you're with a group, you're going to be with other representatives and possibly other senators from other states. So you're going to be moving around quite a bit. And so it's great to just have everything to freshen up. And uh, I, I generally, if I try to bring an extra pair of flats with me. So if I'm wearing shoes and they, after, you know, six hours or so, my feet are hurting, I'll switch it up. Um, but that's the big thing. And also uh, never wear new shoes on the Hill. People, and I have a lot of friends who buy new shoes and they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got these brand. I have a, a very good friend of mine and he wore these great looking Cole Hans and he started getting blisters because they weren't broken in yet. So now they're super comfortable because he's worn them a few times, but he, they were brand new out of the box. And when he was on the Hill, he was hurting. So you, you just have to kind of keep that in mind. Um, I always tell people, you know, you can wear a full suit. Um, there's days where I'm very dressed up on the Hill, especially if I'm going into committee meetings and I know I'm going to be sitting there for a while. Um, but I've also gone to the Hill in business casual, especially Fridays. Um, a lot of Fridays, the members uh, fly home back to district or some are already gone by Thursday night. And so when I'm there on a Friday, a lot of times I'm just going to see my friends on the Hill and just hang out and say hi. Uh, and so I'll wear, I'll wear business casual clothing. Uh, and, you know, and, and it's totally okay if you need to wear jeans. Um, you know, you can wear jeans and a nice sweater um, or a nice top. Uh, that's, that's totally okay. But if you're going on behalf of an organization or if you represent an organization that's going to be sending people to the Hill, um, I highly recommend making recommendations to, to the folks who are going, especially if they've never been. Because that's huge. Because a lot of people uh, get scared because they see members of Congress and they're dressed up. And, you know, normally you see them when they're on TV. So, of course, they're dressed up and they have their hair and makeup done and everything. But for the most part, people dress very casually. And if you need a guide to sort of, you know, tell you what to wear, pay attention to what the staffers are wearing. Because they're there at work every day. And so, and they're moving around. And that's always been, like, my key is I'll point out to people, like, hey, the next time you come, since you're wearing, like, uncomfy shoes look at their shoes like oh those are target flats they're really great or you know teaks or, or rothy's or whatever the popular flats are right now and comfortable shoes when because if you're uncomfortable you're not going to be able to focus on the tasks at hand which is really talking to and connecting with uh the people you're meeting with right and, and again the shoes is a big thing i actually um 
I have an assortment of the kind of sports style uh, Skecher tennis shoes. They're more sneaker style, so they're not bulky. And like I have them in white and I have them in like a powder blue and I have them in black and I have a, so that I can kind of look seamless with my apparel. Um, Cause even at times for myself, I can't even wear dress flat shoes um, because it'll be too much for my feet because, um, you know, plantar fasciitis is a thing, neuropathy. And, uh, I find that, uh, that the, those sketchers like sneaker sporty line are sleek enough and affordable enough that I can wear them and still look nice. And it looks seamless with my outfits. I'll be honest. Um, I'm not really big on wearing skirts. I have dresses and skirts, but I just tend to be more comfortable in slacks. And then I tell people, if you're going to wear slacks, make sure to wear socks that are breathable, um, even in the winter time. And, and you brought up some good points of bringing some things to stay fresh and up. And I always bring an extra pair of socks and, and, fit in my bag. And the other thing, uh, and this is for anyone it's geared towards women or, you know, but like rice paper or oil absorbing sheets. And they're, it's like, I know a couple of brands like clean and clear that have them. It's a really slim box. And I love them because then I don't have to carry as much makeup with me to touch up and I could just blot it. Um, because as you said, people, like, if you've never been, you hustle at times, like, I, and I wear layers as well. And I will take layers off and I'm like, whoa, I feel like I'm running a marathon and you're all sweaty. And you're like, sometimes getting in and at the last minute to catch someone to do your elevator pitch. And I, you will also see people kind of, you know, <gasps> like try to, you know, because you're, you're hustling. So and it's okay. Because there are times I've seen uh, both state, and uh, congressional leaders and senators, they're hustling too. And there's times where I've had conversation and th with them in the hallway and they're doing the same thing, like catching their breath real quick because they took a minute to stop and, you know, uh, speak with you. So remember that everybody's kind of like in the same boat and they're all rushing around and have their little things to stay fresh and up. And you might catch them in a moment where they're hustling and they're going to be trying to catch their breath and it's a-okay. The other thing, uh, I, you know, some people in different medical communities, like they might have an ileostomy bag or um, it's just medical devices and, and they, you know, conversations I've had with them, they're like, it just, I don't know if I want to, you know, be using my catheter, but if I don't, then I'm going to have to stop every 15 to, you know, 20 minutes. And, you know, I personally will encourage people. I said, you know, that's what you're there for. And sometimes, again, that visual is a huge advocacy piece for you that it speaks volumes, like that whole concept, a picture speaks a thousand words or says a thousand words, whatever it is. It's the same thing. And there are times where, you know, sometimes I have to use a cane and um, I don't like having to use a cane, but then over time, I just realized it's just an extension of who I am, but it also gives that visual that I might not look sick or not have any physical uh, disabilities and you know, you can't see inside our bodies. And so sometimes those things actually can help you um, because it's, it's what they see. It's like, okay, this is part of your story. So, you know, again, it's about what you're comfortable with, but, don't shy away. They're not going to judge you. Um, they're not going to think any differently. If anything, from my experience, I've seen that, um, like a lot of our state representatives, senators, congressional leaders, whatnot is, I mean, they really applaud us that despite like what we have to use to show up and be there and be mobile, a lot of them, you know, it's, they're like, wow, some of them I've had, you know, congressional leaders say, and it, you know, like the, you know, you're, you're inspiring to push through all these things and here you are and you're hustling and wobbling <laughs> with your cane and you're still, you know, wanting, you know, it shows how important and how passionate you are about this, that you're 
finding whatever ways to push through to get your message across. So, you know, and the other thing is, you know, have some awareness bracelets or pins. Uh, you can wear those. Um, if your organization has a shirt, I've done it where I've worn like dress slacks and a dress, you know, like suit jacket and have that shirt underneath. Um, or wearing the color, like awareness color for, you know, the community you're advocating for. So, um, and the other thing, what you mentioned earlier was leaving something a little bit behind. I was kind of have like my little type up that I leave behind, but I also leave behind awareness bracelets so that they'll remember um, whether I leave it with the staffer or the actual person. So, and I don't know what they do with them. <laughs> they might be like, okay, thanks. I got a thousand of these, but I, I try to remember those things as well. So, um, and the other thing is uh, from your experience and, and from my experience is the biggest thing is being basically professional, but personable. And again, that kind of ties into what we both said is practicing so that you kind of get over the jitters. And from your experience, not just your personal experience, but I know you've been to DC so many times and you've observed other advocates and groups. And from your, from your visual observation, how successful are those advocates who manage to get that personable story there with the facts and information, how, you know, from your observation, what is the response to their story when they have the personality there? So it, uh, if you're able to deliver your story in a complete uh, but quick manner, and your ask, uh, and you do so in a way that's respectful and friendly and open, the reception is generally really good. Uh, there's no guarantee that everybody will care, that everybody will take action. Um, I have been told by some members of Congress, like, yeah, you know, not really a priority. And okay, fine. So that's where really where it comes down to if you're going to be going for a certain initiative, doing your research on the uh, on the different committees within uh, Congress uh, and understanding where uh, bills would be introduced. So for healthcare purposes, you would look at uh, the health subcommittee, which is under energy and commerce in Congress or the health committee in the Senate. And so those would be the ones that you would would focus on and you can go online and Google uh, both of those, and they'll give you the list of members. Um, and it's also really important too to talk to these uh, staffers or members of Congress and don't lecture them or talk down to them because there are several people on the Hill who uh, have chronic conditions themselves or have a family member or good friend who has a rare disease or, or another condition. Uh, and there are people on Capitol Hill that use assistive devices. Uh, we have uh, Congressman Scalise has been using canes and, and uh, assistive aids since he was shot a couple years ago. Uh, there's a freshman congressman from North Carolina, I believe it's Madison Cawthorn. He's in a wheelchair. Uh, and he, he knows firsthand, you know, how difficult it is to navigate uh, the, the House and, and, um, and Capitol Hill in a wheelchair. So these are, you know, and those are obviously offices where um, the staff is intimately familiar with the difficulties of navigating D.C. with, you know, with the need for these devices. And those are also people that will be sympathetic to uh, what you're discussing just because they themselves are same position we are. So I've, I've sat in countless offices where I've watched advocates share their stories and I've watched the staffer light up and go, oh my gosh, my brother has this problem or, you know, I have a niece with this disease. And, and it's really, really interesting because uh, then you see the connection and then they start asking questions and you do have to be ready for that too. I think one of the other things is that, you know, a lot of times when people are prepping for Capitol Hill, it's like, okay, just tell your story and your ask and they move on to the next person. Well, they may do that and go around the room and, and listen to everybody. And then they may circle back and say, well, hey, Crystal, you mentioned this and I have a question for you. What about this, this and this and be ready? Because my first meeting ever um, with Congressman Bill Arrakis, who is like a, a mentor to me, and I say he's like my second dad because he's we've been working closely together for many years now. Um, the first time I met him, he goes, OK, Candace, well, that's really great. So I'm going to put you on the spot now and I have some questions for you. And I was I wanted to melt into the floor because I'm like, wait, you have questions for me? What, what do you mean? And so he did. He, he drilled me with some questions about repurposing drugs and my treatment and the problems with access. And and that was it. And, and it showed, though, that he was super, super into 
what I was advocating for, what I was talking about, the struggles that we were experiencing. And so you have to be ready for that too, because they are going to, you know, they're going to ask. Uh, and if you don't know the answer, it's the perfect segue to go, you know what? I don't have an answer like right in front of me, but if you give me your card, I'll email you and we can discuss it. And that's, you know, you just kind of let it sleep, seamlessly roll off your back. Um, and, and you always want to try to continue the conversation just because you go to DC and you have a great meeting doesn't mean your work is done. You have to continue talking to them uh, throughout the process. And even if you can't make it back to Washington again, or during COVID-19, you couldn't go to Capitol Hill because it was closed. It doesn't mean that they're not working. It just means that you're going to be doing things differently. So you may be talking on Zoom, you may be talking on the phone, or you may just be emailing. Right. And that's, and you brought up a good point on, and there are times too, I've been asked and it's just, I probably didn't know the information and it's just like, whoop, because I got brain fog on and sometimes, and I'll say the same thing. I'll be like, you know what? I I'll, you know, I'll say, I don't want to give you information that is not fully correct. I have some of it, but I would, you know, like you said, if you give me your business card, not only will I follow up with those, but I'll, I'll send you additional information like stats or research or uh, information that's about, it might be above and beyond what they're looking for. But I feel like when you do that and you get the card and you follow up with the email, sending the information that might be like research that supports the information that they asked about statistics, uh, it really strengthens the tangibility and the need of your ask especially when it might be something where you say, well, there hasn't been any research done on X, Y, Z in a decade, or like with fibromyalgia, they haven't developed a medication to help manage the symptoms of fibromyalgia since 2009. And this is why we need more support from the FDA and the in treatment development, you know, and then, and those are, that's an example of if you're advocating for more treatments or better treatment options and following up with that. And like you said, it's like being prepared. And, and um, I know for myself, I kind of treat it like a job interview. <laughs> and if you're going in for an interview, you want to think of every potential question they might ask you about your personal experience or the community's experience and having, and it's okay to have a cheat sheet with you. They're very understanding. They have their own cheat sheets as well because they're constantly uh, dealing with an influx of information and questions all day long on a variety of um, issues and topics. So it's, it's okay to have your little folder or binder with different things. And I always will say, you know, this just helps me to stay focused. And if I get nervous, I won't forget something important. And you, you can reference it. And, and uh, I know a lot of the individuals at Capitol Hill or even our state's you know, capital, they appreciate that you're coming prepared. Um, and, and it's a visual, uh, pr you know, presenting to them that you respect their time and know that information is pertinent to them. Um, but yeah, it, and, and again, it's like, there are times where we could be the expert on a particular topic, but we lose our train of thought in that whole following up. But the other thing is, which um, I know that you have done as well, whether it was you had a lot of successful connections or like you said, you could come across someone who's like, well, this isn't a priority. This is what, not what we focus on. But I always like to follow up with a thank you. Um, and I'll do both an email and a thank you note in, in the mail. Uh, and even if it was someone who wasn't interested, I'll say, you know, I really appreciate you taking the time to listen. I understand this is not the area that you're focusing on, but it meant a lot that the fact that you don't focus on this and you still listened, you know, really validated uh, my experience. And one time, well, one individual, I, I send those out, but one individual who had informed me in Congress that that wasn't an area they focused on that follow-up recognizing that they took the time for something that wasn't really in their arena and then stating that even though this wasn't your area that you're working on the fact that you listen made me feel validated and supported and I truly appreciate that and what happened was that person did a 180 and reached out and was like you know what 
okay, I'm going to help you. I'm going to connect you. I'm going to, you know, and it was amazing. It was for a mental health initiative many years ago. So, and that, you never know. It's one of those things you never know that it could, you can end up turning someone 180 who wasn't going to support the initiative. And then they do simply by doing a gesture of kindness and following up. And um, so we, you know, you brought up a lot of great points, uh, having that 60 minute elevator pitch or, you know, two minute pitch that includes personal testimony, uh, which I feel is important because it does help elicit like an emotional response Mm -hmm. from your audience for a uh, lack of a better term, along with some factual and, you know, statistical information. Um, do you have your advocacy pitch ready to go in the event that you never know where you're at? I, there's times I go to events and I have a state representative there that didn't expect was going to be there. And I'm like, Hey, um, and then having that pitch. So do you, you know, do you have a couple of pitches that you want to sh share with us? that you use? Can I put you on the spot? <laughs> sure. Yeah. So generally like, so I run into people all over the place, especially when I'm in DC, just like have a drink at a bar and then there comes Congressman so-and-so walking by, you know, and, and, and sometimes, you know, I'll just get up and go, you know, hi, Congressman. Uh, my name is Candace Lerman. Um, I have a rare blood disorder that I actually put in remission with an off-label drug. And I've been working with Congress for the last couple of years trying to get this bill called the Open Act through so I can help 30 million Americans with rare diseases like me have the same opportunity. And I just leave it at that. And they're like, you know, everybody, everybody goes like, wow, I want to hear more about this. And, and so sometimes it's just when you're catching them in a, in a neutral, I call it a neutral zone, right? So you're not on the hill or they're not in the hallway, you're not on the elevator, you're just out somewhere, or perhaps you're at a dinner meeting. I've run into senators at, at dinners and, you know, I go and I say the same thing, you hook them in and they're like, oh, really? Who are you working with? Or if you are kind of up to date about the relationships between members of the house and Senate or, you know, relationships with uh, your, your state representatives. Um, I always will say to people who I know are good, uh, close friends of Congressman Bill Arrakis, like, Oh yeah, I work with Congressman Bill Arrakis on, on uh, this initiative. And they're always like, Oh really? Well, what, what is it? What is, you know, I want to know more about it. And so you give them the opening to do that in some situations where I've run into people, they're, they're running to a, a dinner meeting or they're running late. Uh, and so they'll, a lot of times they'll just hand me their card and say, call my chief of staff or call my legislative director. Here's their direct line. And please speak to them about this because I've heard about this or I've heard a lot of people tell me, oh my gosh, I've, I heard all about you because Gus talks about you. Um, when I met, uh, when he was the speaker of the house, Paul Ryan, uh, he knew my whole story. He repeated it back to me and I was shocked. And he was like, no, Gus has told me all about you. So when I heard you were here in DC, I wanted to meet you and, and, and talk to you for a few minutes. And so you never know when you're making those connections and talking to your lawmakers, like who knows your story. And so that's why it's sometimes it's really great to just have like a hook, like, oh, I'm working on this. And this is why, because it happened to me. And they generally will, you know, it, it opens up the opportunity for them to ask you um, some questions and then that creates a dialogue. So you're, you know, you know, uh, sort of where they're at. Um, I've spoken to uh, a Senator, um, one night at a dinner, I ran into Senator Rubio and he, uh, was supporting my bill. Um, he wasn't the main co-sponsor, but he, and, and so uh, a friend of mine who, uh, who knew him was like, Oh, Senator Rubio, this is Candace. Uh, she's one of the people behind the open act. And he was like, Oh my gosh, the open act repurposing drugs. Yeah. 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 Like that's so great. You know, there's so many drugs that we could repurpose and they're probably sitting on shelves and they're cheap and we're not doing this right now. And I don't understand why, why we're not making this happen. And I was shocked because I'm like, I'm at a dinner. He has no reason to really know anything about open act because it wasn't really moving at the time in the Senate help committee, but he knew it. And so now when I see him, he's like, Hey, open act. And, and you'll, you'll find that you build uh, a lot of that stuff up. And sometimes it's just literally having that hook. Uh, and I, I commonly describe it to like, if we you know when you're scrolling through social media and you see that salacious gossip headline about, let's say, uh, uh, Prince Harry and Meghan, right? And, you know, because everybody likes to talk about them. And you read like, oh, what did they do this week? Let's click on it. You know, sometimes you have to create your own clickbait headline type thing where it's a it's a an interesting tidbit about yourself, an interesting tidbit about perhaps a, a, a piece of legislation that's sitting in in the Washington D.C. purgatory, and you get them interested in it. And then you know, you see you see what happens. It's like fishing. If you throw out the hook and you see what bites, you know, you may come back with something great. 
You know, and you brought up a, a, a good point about utilizing social media to get the word out. And, you know, for myself, an example would be is I am a service connected army veteran. I qualify for free health care at the VA. But the problem is the veteran affairs healthcare system really doesn't provide a lot of options for managing the symptoms of fibromyalgia or um, some of my other conditions that causes a lot of chronic pain. And I'm not saying that there's a, you know, a plethora of options in the private sector, but there's more than at, than there is at the VA. And one of my, part of my pitch is, you know, as a military veteran who is service connected with disabilities, I qualify for free healthcare. However, there are treatments out there that are provided in the private sector that the VA is not providing. And so I have to pay out of pocket for private healthcare to get the treatments that I need. And not only that, but the, it's a waste of taxpayer dollars that we have the largest healthcare system, the veteran affairs, and I'm paying out of pocket to get a treatment that isn't offered, you know, and, and I've had uh, some legislators and uh, my state reps be like, yeah, that makes no sense. And I'm like, yeah. And so then I'll kind of, you know, pitch, I, I've been trying to figure out how do I advocate, you know, for this, you know, to get this on the VA's radar as an option. And I know like, you said is knowing who the committees are and there is the VA uh, committee majority in Congress, but sometimes going back to the basics is building those relationships with your state representatives because they all, they all know each other and they know they can help open the doors and they'll tell your story for you where like here we have military veterans who are diagnosed with fibromyalgia and these other chronic pain conditions who would benefit from this treatment, but the VA doesn't offer it. And it's actually more cost-effective in the long run, especially, you know, you could bring in the opiate crisis on that and say, you know, this would reduce the reliance on pain medications if we were to have this treatment, you know, consistently every four to six weeks. So that's the other thing too, is sometimes your champion is not necessarily the person that you think it's going to be. But the other thing is they all talk. Right. So we all know in our communities, everybody knows everybody, everybody talks, everybody has an opinion and it's the same thing. They all talk. And then if you can make someone passionate about your passion, they'll talk about it to other congressional leaders or state representatives or senators and whatnot. And then you, you gained allies without even realizing it. Yes. And the other thing is to not be afraid to ask um, if you have a relationship uh, with a staffer at an office, um, and you need to t talk to somebody, uh, perhaps like a ranking member of a committee, uh, that's your target for a legislative initiative, to ask them if they can get you an introduction. I have done that several times um, over the years, especially uh, as, uh, you know, uh, minority and majority between the party switches. And so the control uh, is different. And that plays into, you know, who do you need to pitch the bill to, who, who will have the votes, or how will the vote split? Uh, will, will the bill be introduced to committee? Will it pass committee and go on for a full house vote? Things like that. And so don't be afraid to ask them, hey, I need to speak to uh, Senator so-and-so's office. She's hard to get a hold of. Um, you know, do you know somebody there that you can, um, you know, introduce me to? Um, sometimes I've literally just been handed a business card and, been, and they write the name of the staffer on the back and go, go see so-and-so and hand them this. And so, and I've walked into the office and been like, hi, I'm here for so-and-so. And, you know, this person sent me and they're like, okay. And they come right out and they're like, oh yeah, they, she just texted me or he just texted me. Come on in, let's sit down and chat. Easy as that. And so, but sometimes it's just asking, um, and, you know, the, the challenge is when you go to Capitol Hill, every day is different there, um, depending on the schedule and the votes and what's, uh, what's at stake uh, or what's going on or what they're working on. Um, you know, you may only have a 15 minute meeting. 
uh, there's been times where I've sat for over an hour talking to somebody's legislative director um, and going through, you know, several uh, issues. So I pretty much have like a little Rolodex in my head of what everybody said to me, like, oh, man, I really wish we could solve this problem. Or I'd love to know who I need to speak to about this. And I'll bring a notepad because I always take notes. It's another thing that you really should do is take notes and, and write stuff down. Um, and so I'll just sit there and say, OK, next issue, this, this and this. What do you su suggest? Great. And never be afraid to ask them for advice. Uh, sometimes they'll tell you, and especially with healthcare legislation, that you have to address issues with HHS or OIG or FDA or CDC. And so sometimes, you know, the issue isn't necessarily with Congress that we become an administrative rulemaking procedure. And then you have to go to the administrative ed agencies under the executive branch. And so that's where a lot of times I'll ask like, hey, do you have a contact there? Or who do you think I should reach out to? And a lot of times I'll just get an email introduction to the person I need to speak with. And then you can speak with them as well. So not, a lot of times when we talk about advocacy, we're focused on lawmakers um, and, and people who are elected to office. But there's also an entire separate section of advocacy dedicated to um, executive branch functioning. And that's a completely different beast. Um, but don't be afraid to ask your uh, legislative contacts for um, some sort of int formal introduction into the, into that separate group. Right. And I have a real life example of, uh, my district, um, state representative. I, I just, you know, I was at a community day, um, at a, at a veteran, whatever the VFW and they did a community day for the public. So anybody could come in and just, it was for the community, like camaraderie and, and the VFW reviewing, like, this is what we do. We do all these things for veterans, but this is how we give back to our community that, you know, our post is located in. And it, you know, I'm all, it was, you know, it was a hot day and I, I'm like in skinny jeans and a female, like an army veteran t-shirt. And I'm all like, whoo, like I'm all sweaty. And then there was my district representative. And then, you know, just sitting outside, very casually talking and, uh, you know, just saying that, you know, these are some of the things that I do and I'm working on. And at the time I was helping my friend, uh, Brian Talley, who will be a uh, part of this educational series as well. And at the time, um, he had the tally bill, which was something that would positively impact veterans and protect their health care and due process rights if it were to pass it, you know, in Congress. And so I was just talking to my district representative of Ohio, and I said, you know, part of the reason why I'm so passionate about this is not simply because this is my friend and fellow advocate, but I've also experienced similar situations, but thank goodness it did not, you know, become life-threatening like it did for my friend. Mm -hmm. And you know, I said, so I'm here just to kind of network and just talk to people because the community is just as important to get their support. Not necessarily, you don't necessarily need all of your supporters for your initiative to be within your medical community or whatever community you're representing. It, it's very powerful to have people who might not be affected by the condition, who might not be in the community, be a voice for you as well, because it's not something that impacts them, but they're passionate about it. And so I was just, you know, talking to my district representative who uh, unbeknownst to me, I didn't know he was going to be there and he showed up and I'm all sweaty and gross because, you know, I'm running around, it's hot. And he just said, Hey, listen, it, here's my card. Call me. My cell phone's on it. Uh, if you need help with uh, the senators getting on board, let me know, call me. I'll give you Senator Portman's cell phone number. I'm like, Okay. You know, and it's an instance mm -hmm. of like when you were at the restaurant, you just never know. And here I'm walking into something, uh, an event. And I, I took the opportunity, regardless how gross and sweaty I was, and just <laughs> took the opportunity to say, you know, these are the things I'm passionate about and, and, and working on and supporting. And it led to, if you have a hard time uh, with any of our Ohio senators on this, just reach out to me and and I'll, I'll connect you to the right person. So, you know, again, it's about networking, but building those relationships. Uh, don't discount someone who might not be an individual that could be directly involved, but they can connect you to the right person. And, and taking, 
advantage of those golden opportunities and moments that present themselves. And remember that they are people just like us and they're not unapproachable. Uh, you know, I've joked around with my state representatives and staffer, their staffers, and also including my state governor on some things and their staffers, you know, just uh, different issues. Another thing, it's not, wasn't legislative, but we had uh, recently a gentleman who was released early from prison uh, into transitional housing. Um, and it, this individual had initially gone to prison for fraud and all these great things and noticing on social media, all of a sudden they have it, this nonprofit set up targeting people and getting their money. And, and a friend of mine, we were looking at it and I was like, it, it presents itself at social media as legit, but we knew it wasn't legit. And so she was reaching out to the veteran coordinator of Congressman Gonzalez's office. And then I was reaching out to my friend who works with the FBI and say, hey, this, this guy has to be out from what I looked up that he must be out on parole. And he probably was let out early due to uh, coronavirus. And so like figuring out who to uh, talk to and say, hey, it, like understanding like this person is saying that they have a veterans organization that's nonprofit to support veterans. Uh, he was on an early release program and mm -hmm. he's doing these things he's not supposed to be doing and, and looking at our contacts to say, okay, who could we talk to? And then I ended up calling um, Congressman Gonzalez's veteran coordinator on this and left a message and said, you know, have you heard anything more about this? Because I don't want to post on social media yet that this is fraud because if he's not been picked up or the parole officer or the feds haven't been made aware, I'm like, based on his criminal history that I looked up, I don't need him getting mad at me and finding me. So, and then having, having that 20 minute conversation with Congressman Gonzalez's veteran coordinator and what they were doing. And then my friend with the FBI is like, here, this is who you call. Um, and then my friend who started this conversation with the congressman's office, this concern we had, and it was literally addressed within a week and the individual was picked up by the feds. But, you know, again, it's sometimes like, who do you know? Uh, and then I use that opportunity <laughs> Because I'm terrible. I take them. I'm like, golden opportunity. I got the congressman's veteran coordinator on the phone. So I started talking about some of the veteran legislative uh, bills that had passed and then some things I was excited that passed. And I talked about the tally bill and the veteran coordinator talked about uh, uh, some bills that Congressman Gonzalez pushed through that got signed into law. And then I ended up started talking about some of the initiatives I wanted to work on for veterans with the veteran coordinator and already started putting it on their radar, even though we were discussing a totally different topic. But I'm, you know, it's like, I'm going to bring this home because I'm going to be calling them again when I start these initiatives that I brought up. So yeah, I don't know. Some people I'm like, I know it's terrible, but I, I take every possible second of an opportunity to get everything jam packed in and, you know, and, and, and I don't care. And that's like the whole thing I tell people, listen, I know you're advocating, but sometimes you get a one, a one stop shop and you have to be passionate, but also kind of not care enough throwing everything in as, as much as you can when an opportunity presents itself, because you never know, you never know what it leads to, but that's just me. I'm not shy. <laughs> so so now <laughs> with that said, in your experience with legislative advocacy, um, along with, and also your licensed attorney. So what are, uh, you know, as we're wrapping up here, when uh, people are getting ready to create their pitch or put facts together for when they go to DC or if they do it virtually or via phone. Uh, what are some little like tips and tricks that 
you feel might be important that will help them be remembered, whether it's in an email, a phone call, in person, virtually, kind of that little sort of, for lack of a better term, namesake, like that will help whoever you speak with remember you down the road if you call again or reach out again. What are some ideas you have for that? So the first thing is I always tell people you want to answer the who, what, where, when, and why. You want to be as thorough as possible because you never know um, what detail or statistic or story is going to stick with people. Um, And when you're in, especially if you're in a room or on a call with several advocates, and let's say you're all sharing your stories, um, if there's something in particular that you're really passionate about and you want them to remember, it may take several times of discussing it with someone uh, before it really sticks. And, And I can definitely say that, you know, there are some offices on Capitol Hill that I've met with that immediately, like, it was very clear that I had made an impression. So I always go back and I always talk to the, to these people. Um, and it's also really important too, to know that uh, as members of Congress retire or, or they get voted out or, or whatever, the staffers generally don't just go away. They go to another office. And so I have friends that have worked in several offices uh, since I met them years ago. And I, you know, I, I go in and um, I meet, uh, I meet, their colleagues and, and talk and they'll say, oh yeah, this is Candace. She worked on Cures and Open Act. And they're like, oh yeah, I remember that. I worked for so-and-so and you know, they weren't really, uh, they weren't in a committee that dealt with Cures. They just voted on the final bill. But oh, that's really interesting. And uh, you know, it may just be something simple as that or, oh, you have a blood disorder. Yeah, I have a cousin with hemophilia and, and it, it's little things. And so just really being able to answer the who, what, where, when, and why, you'll never know exactly what it is for each person that they pick up on. And sometimes it will take a, a repetition or, or a repeated contact. And other times things will just flow naturally. So the best thing you can do is just put all the information out there. Um, it's short and sweet. I always tell people that's the best thing you can do. And always let them know if you're with an organization, what organization you're with. Because chances are, if you're, if you're working with an organization that's done some work on Capitol Hill or is connected to some other organizations that perhaps have lobbyists that are on the Hill, to work on um, efforts, they'll remember, oh yeah. And, and I've had times where um, I've worked on stuff and they'll be like, oh, do you know so-and-so with this group? Uh, and I'm like, well, yeah, they're a friend of mine. Oh, okay, instant connection. And, and then they're like, then they start talking about, oh, well, they spoke about this issue and this issue. Well, we're, we have the same problem. And I see that a lot with uh, health conditions. Um, I've done a lot of advocacy for um, rare epilepsies and autism. And so those groups tend to have an, a meaningful impact. And a lot of times I've had uh, staffers say to me, oh yeah, I've heard about this and this, you know, would this, and we've talked about proposing legislation to address this issue. Would that be something that would help the community you're working with? Yes. And so that's why it's really important to answer those questions because a lot of times when the staffers are listening to you and taking notes, they're thinking about all the other meetings they have uh, throughout the weeks and months where they're talking to constituents and other groups. So that's the really critical thing. And they may not come out and tell you directly like, oh, I know so-and-so or this group met with me three weeks ago and we had a similar discussion, but they know. And so that's why it, it's really critical to, to put out everything, to have that, that one sheet, to have your pitch, to tie it to your personal story, because you never know where that's going to go uh, beyond your meeting. But generally speaking, a lot of these staffers have several meetings per week with other staffers too. So you may tell your story to two people who uh, in discussion of a potential bill or some proposed legislation say, oh, well, we met with you know, the, the veterans uh, with fibromyalgia group and, and they were talking about this stuff and somebody says, oh, I met with them too, Crystal, right? Yeah, oh yeah, 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 my boss would love this and oh, my boss said this was great too. And that's how these things happen. And so that's why it's really important to cast a very wide net to talk to everybody you can, uh, just because somebody doesn't sit on a committee uh, or participate within, you know, a certain um, legislative process, whether it's, you know, if they're not on the health subcommittee, but perhaps they're in energy and commerce and transportation, there's nothing wrong with talking to them and, and sharing your story because you never know when somebody's going to be sitting in a meeting and you'll sometimes get an email from a staffer that says, Hey, you were the topic of conversation today at our meeting. And like, what me? Really? And they're like, yeah, we were talking about X, Y, Z, and you had met with so-and-so and and they remembered you. And that's why it's so important to, to really, uh, you know, connect your story and your message to your ask 
and uh, and continue to make those connections and facilitate the conversation. Because a lot of times it will result in uh, your voice and your story being used as a catalyst for change. Absolutely. And just there's just so many beautiful pieces in what you just represented is that you just never know. Don't be afraid to network. Um, and, you know, another thing is, and we've mentioned this, is, you know, the power of social media. And you know what? I've thrown out friend requests to my state representatives and some of them have accepted a bit and I accepted them and I'm like on Facebook and I'm like, okay. And then if I, um, you know, had a moment where they listened to me on, on whatever particular topic, whether they could directly support me or not, you know, I'll post that social media. Like I was so excited to um, be able to meet so-and-so today and just, so humbled that they listen to my story and um or like tagging their their pages on social media and i'll be honest i've done it for both you know as a thank you but also i've done it uh to put something on their radar as well mm -hmm. um i did that with the tally bill um i i've done that with um some things with the cdc um I did it uh, for people who watch this, uh, Candace, myself, and another advocate, Frank Rivera, we put out um, a national call to action um, at the beginning of the coronas, uh, coronavirus pandemic in the United States, imploring and advocating that grocery retailers accommodate those with disabilities and compromised immune systems. And I had, you know, tagged a whole bunch of grocery retailers on that, but I had also like in the comments, like tagged <laughs> some local and state representatives because uh, guess what? A lot of them are backed or they might get some campaign funds from major or regional grocery stores. So I put that in the radar uh, to be like, Hey, cause they, I, even though I didn't know them, some of them personally, or, and there's a couple I didn't even meet that I tagged because <laughs> I have no shame, but I'm kind of like, all right, the state representative got some campaign funds from this major grocery chain, you know, and so tagging that grocery chain and that person that received support for their run for office on the same post, like those are little things too to help your initiatives that are not necessarily in person, but on social media. Mm -hmm. um, and again, you know, this is just information for people to build on. I'm one of those people and you're one of these individuals. We've been doing this for years and years and it's kind of like we could do it in our sleep. And again, I have no shame. I'm not saying that, you know, people to do what I do because I know it takes a lot of uh, gumption for lack of a better term to do those things. But sometimes you never know. And I, I, there was a veteran legislative bill put together by uh, disabled American veterans uh, to protect females, both veteran, non-veteran and female employees from sexual assault and sexual harassment and at the facilities through the VA. And I tagged, a, you know, my, my district state representative and, he commented and was like, I'm going to bring this all the way to the top in the House of Representatives of Ohio. And, and again, it's like I said, there's, there's more opportunity uh, with social media to create those networks or be bold and tag them. And I'll be honest, nine times out of 10, they don't respond because they have staffers who are watching their social media, but you just never know. And always, always take advantage of potential opportunities for your efforts because someone eventually is going to listen. Someone is eventually going to pay attention. And, and at the end of the day, that's all we're trying to accomplish is get that person interested and then they'll help you get the ball rolling. So, well, so thank you so much for joining us today. You're just such a wealth of knowledge. And I know you and I personally could, we met for those who watch this, uh, Candace and I are constantly messaging and 
I, like, hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? What are your thoughts on this? How should I approach this? And, and you're just a wealth of knowledge. And I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to share your personal experience, recommendations, and ideas to help individuals who are going to move on that legislative path of advocacy. And uh, for, for the viewers, uh, make sure you follow Candice on her social media uh, sites. Her handle is at Rare Candice on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And you also have a website and a blog at Rare Candice where you share some of your insights and experiences living with chronic conditions, a rare disease, and some of your efforts on the Hill, and even some of your efforts within your state that you live to bring about positive changes. So until next time, everybody, make sure you make your self-care and self-love your number one priority. And if this video was helpful, please like and share. And thank you so much, Candice. Truly appreciate thank it. Thank you.